welcome to Logan Sounds Off, where I talk about books, music, and a whole lot more. I'm your host, Logan Kelly. Hello and welcome to Logan Sounds Off. Today I am interviewing Colm O'Reilly. Colm, how are you? I'm very well, thank you for having me on. Um, For those who don't know you, Colm, who are you and what do you do? Okay, that's a that's a long existential question there. But the main thing is, is uh, I work here in Dublin City University, where I'm the director of a program called the Centre for Talented Youth in Ireland. And that program works with high ability students across the country. Brilliant. And for those who might know this or don't know this, I actually attend CTYI and it's it's brilliant. And um, but for those who don't know about CTYI, could you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, of course. So um it's a really nice program. Um we kind of find that what we do is we're based in the university, so we are have access to facilities that people in school may not have. So we offer courses to students who are good academically or good at school or interested is another thing in subjects that they may not be able to take in school. So that might be stuff like forensic science or medicine yeah. or veterinary science and marine biology. Psychology was one that I was looking at going, wow. Yeah. So psychology is very popular because it has a bit of humanities and a bit of science in it. And then... We have courses like engineering and maths, of course, and then on computer gaming and app design. And then for people who like the humanities more, we have like things like debating or model United Nations or writing courses. The great thing about these type of courses is, is that we've lots of students on them. So there's a lot of variety and it can be driven by what the students are interested in as opposed to us saying, oh, this is what we think you should learn. This will be really interesting. It's much more, I want to learn more about forensic science. I want to do more stuff on chemistry and we'll put on courses. That would be probably more advanced than what the student would be used to at school, but definitely not too difficult that it would be a chore to go and it should be fun and exciting when we put the courses and classes on it really is actually it's like for those who may have a child who is gifted or has a lot of knowledge like ctyi is brilliant because it's fun it's really educational like i've learned so much but it's really fun and the thing is you're in a class of like 20 of your peers so it's really handy and i'm doing director's cut at the moment um, and I'm starting to film in two days for our film um, uh, but it's it's they're very fun courses they really are and I think you're right saying they're more t- um, the whole idea is towards fun more than education it is educational and there, that is one of the purposes of CTYI but fun is one of the main ones as well um, yeah, I think that when you work with uh, yeah. smart kids, it's important to have a balance between academic and social development. Um, I think that academically, you have students who are very good and interested in lots of stuff, so you give them exposure to those subjects. But socially, as you kind of highlighted, it's great to meet people who are the same age as yourself, who are interested in the same things. And it's great to do things that are, aren't just reading from a book, whereas like I think director's cut's a good idea because you get to make a little movie. And it's very practical and hands-on, but it's not pressure. It's more, oh, this is kind of a cool thing to do and we're all supporting you to do it. And I think that that's usually important for these types of programs that people come out of them going, I enjoyed that. I learned loads, but exactly as you're saying, but most of all, God, I had some fun and it wasn't boring. And I'm like excited to go the following week. I think that people have big misconceptions about courses like this, that, oh, we're going to spend our time in a library or we're just going to be reading from a book or, oh, we must have some very hard texts. It's totally not that. I think it's so much more important to do things that are, you learn while you're actually practically actively doing it. Yeah, and and I just want to say something that 
really is like really good um like in my opinion is brilliant is that the teachers aren't very strict about things like they'd be strict but they're very relaxed and they're very casual and like i we ended up talking about the matrix and stuff in our last lesson and um, as examples for how lighting works and things so it's always ctyi is always very interesting and you mentioned model you went there i did that last term okay. and it was very interesting as well but um how do you choose the subjects for ctyi um in like there some of them are brilliant and some of them are very exotic and out there now in a good way so a lot so they're all very different and there's something for everybody definitely can you explain how you kind of pick um the different yeah, subjects that's a great question um look it's really driven by what we think people are going to be interested in and we do that by asking them really you know so as you probably you alluded thank saying that you know you think our instructors and staff are good a lot of them are former students or you know were on the course when they were younger so they'll have a great idea of what like somebody aged 11 would like to have studied on a saturday while they're in dcu and they might have pitch an idea to us i think directors cuts a great idea and we'd say well how would we do that say, oh we can make a movie on your phone or we have some cameras that we can use or we have computers that we can help for and they're very enthusiastic and interested in it we'll say wow let's try that and see how it goes see if it works then there's more traditional subjects like say medicine or law or stuff we might have some of our former students who are currently studying medicine or studying law and they might come to us and say i'd love to teach that to a younger age but i don't want it to be as kind of heavy as what i would do every day i want it to be fun and interesting so we could talk about cases in law that are really exciting and really interesting for younger people or we could talk about medicine and exotic diseases and stuff so that people can understand and know how medicine works and we know those people then will be very engaged and able to teach well and understand what younger people are looking for when they come on courses like this. So in relation to that, we're so open-minded. And then we have some great people who come to us and go, let's do, I'm doing study, postgrad study in myths and legends. And I think I could teach a course in that about Irish myths and legends. And they know so much about it and they're so passionate that we say, wow, they're going to be great with younger people. Probably difficulty is, is that, you know, the older the student is, the probably easier it is to replicate what we do at college because the students are older and able to understand it. Whereas I suppose if you go back to when kids are six and seven, it's much more difficult because their concentration wouldn't be as good as somebody, say, your age. They wouldn't have as much exposure to previous things as somebody older. So we really have to put really practical, fun things for them to do while learning as they go along. But that is more challenging than, say, 8 to 12 and like 13 to 16 year old secondary school programs. They're the easiest because they're really pretty similar to what you would do if you were actually at university. Wow, that's very that's actually very interesting that you say that. And I actually have a question about the teachers who will be in college at the moment in DCU who come over to do courses with like I can't wait for Saturday this Saturday and um, for the time that I'm recording. But would the teachers be looking forward to it as well? Would you, would they have the same enjoyment as the pupils? I Very so. much so. That's a great question. Like it's, I feel like I'm in a very fortunate position in where I work. Okay, so I get to manage this brilliant program, which has so many students like yourself, but so many other people who are like you and different people who come on it and really get some fun out of it. But I also get to manage like a staff of teachers of about maybe 60 or 70 people. And they are the most like enthusiastic, passionate, interesting people that you could ever meet. And they really care about their subject and they really care about people liking it and making their class as interesting and entertaining as possible. And they'll chat to us about how they can achieve that and we'll help them and facilitate them, but they're driving it greatly. And probably the best teachers are ones who may have worked for a year as a teaching assistant, as you see them in your class. So they're observing other teachers doing it. They're learning as they're going along. And then they're coming to us with their own ideas to 
make something as fun as what they just were working with, and he's sometimes even better. And as I said, former students who've been on the program when they were younger are probably the best resource we can have because not only do they understand the content, they also can empathize with why people would come on a course on Saturday. And as you said yourself, you're very enthusiastic and looking forward to it. They get that rather than, oh, I just, it's another Saturday job. I have to go in and yeah. like looking in a shop. I can't wait for it to be over. They're like, wow, they've got loads of people who are enthusiastic and interested in what they're talking about. So they want it to be the best experience for those people because they were those people when they were 10 and 11 themselves. That's really interesting. And I thought in my head, something that I only said a couple of days ago is that you can have somebody who's researched and researched and researched on a project, but only if somebody's experienced it firsthand can you get the real proper information. And I think that's very interesting. But you said there are former students would usually be teachers. Um, CTYI um, has been going on for 30 years. Would we know anyone who has come out of CTYI that might be famous or very popular at the moment? Okay, well, I think our most famous student is Ivana Lynch. Ivana Lynch was Luna Lovegood in the Harry Potter movies. Oh, yeah! So yeah. Ivana came and it's actually a very good story. She was just cast in Harry Potter before she started coming to CTYI. But her sisters had attended. So the movie that she was in was just about to be released while she was on the program. So she was hugely popular. People knew her. But she was so... The very interesting thing, and I really like this about Ivana, would have been that she really loved the course she was on and really loved the program and was really into CTYI and like was going for the weekend to premieres of the Harry Potter movie over in the UK. They were flying her over, but she was as enthusiastic about the course she was studying at CTY when she came back. So that was really, really nice. Uh, so she's kind of thing. A lot of other people are people who like, you know, uh, would work in politics now or maybe in the media or maybe in companies related to, you know, engineering or computing and stuff like that. So they're, I think they're doing very well and they're kind of establishing themselves more and making great contributions to the field that they're in. And I think that that's great. I don't even think you have to be, like, obviously, look, Ivan is very famous, but I think that, to me, it's great when you have people who are brilliant in their field and are making a real kind of a contribution to it. And I say that, like, obviously, because I work in a university, so field is like field of research or academia, but it doesn't even have to be that. It can be like, you know, you could want to direct a movie yourself when you're older. You might want to be a doctor and become like a really famous surgeon. You might want to be an engineer and start your own company to do a problem that you perceive that the like say help in the environment that isn't been done at the moment. And it's not like we can do that for you, but we can kind of sow the seeds to get you interested to do that so that you'll do it yourself. And that will make you so much happier in your job because it'll be something you're passionate about and want to do. And that's why it's fortunate that we get these incredibly talented students like yourself when you're younger, but also staff members when they're like young and enthusiastic about their careers and want to do a lot of stuff. And then subsequently, they'll go on and do great things. So I think it's really, really nice. Wow, that's a brilliant answer there. And I love the term you use there, sowing seeds. I, I definitely think of that as kind of like nearly um, a motto nearly for CTYI. They sow the seeds of young people. That's basically what it is. Um, and I'd like to shift gears, actually, and from CTY to a whole different matter. And um, as you might know, um, I like music, but something that I wanted to intertwine with CTY here is, um, does music benefit children in any way? I definitely think so. Uh, I think music benefits everybody in some capacity, obviously. 
uh, be it like as you said yourself, you like the guitar, you like to play yeah. it. That you said it's not that easy, so you have to work at doing it. That's a brilliant lesson for everyone to learn. You know, I think that if you did something and it was too easy to do, it takes the value away from it. But if there's something you have to practice and do better and you get better at by working on it, that's a lesson we really want to learn, not just for guitar, for everything you <laughs> ever do in your life. So that's brilliant. That music is important as well. Like if you think of it, every single big occasion I'm sure you've ever been at has had some music at it. There's music yes. at confirmation. There's music at... You're at weddings. There's I'm singing for a confirmation actually now. Great, congratulations. And I think as well at Christmas, we all remember like Christmas carols or Christmas concerts or, you know, everybody likes going to stuff where oh, you don't even have to be able to perform it yourself or do it. You can appreciate the value of it. And I think that that's why music is timeless in the context that it's been around forever and that people have used it to, you know, at times of like happiness, at times of sadness, at times when you need a lift, at times when you want to relieve your boredom, at times when you're excited or interested. I just think it's fantastic as a kind of something that people can have access to, be it as their career in some instances, but also just as a hobby or a passion or an interest. So I totally encourage uh, people to get involved in it. Sometimes it helps people study. Sometimes it helps people get their mind off other things. I, I just think music is a fantastic thing. And it's there's so much of it and so much variety. There's something in it for everyone. Wow, I completely agree with you on that. Good. That music can suit every single mood. And this leads me on beautifully to my next question. So I like I the lead-ins. Um, yeah, it, I, it's brilliant when you get a lead in like this. Um, as a child, what kind of music did you listen to growing up? Yeah, like that's a really interesting question. It was funny because I was thinking, because obviously I've listened to your podcast. I'm really interested. And obviously most people on it are more musical than me. So uh, yeah, really, like I think it's very interesting. So I suppose I've thought a tiny bit about it, right? So I would say like I... Uh, like I'm old, obviously, right? That's that's. A, <laughs> Don't that's say good, that about yourself. Sometimes that's a good thing because it gives you experience. Yeah, true. But I'm happy with it. I'm reconciled yeah. to it, you know. So I would have been born in the '70s, okay. So it's interesting when I think of music now and the ease of access we have to it all the time like obviously i've spotify and apple music i have like literally every song that's ever written at my disposal exactly, instantaneously yeah. if i want to listen to it whereas in the 70s i would have been like i was the youngest in my family so my brother would have listened to like led zeppelin and yes thin well, lizzy and, and the ramones okay so that was very guitar-y bass stuff you yeah. know and, Obviously, he's 10 years older, so he was a child that that was, like, the music at the time, you know? <laughs> so I would have thought that was, like, I probably would have learned to appreciate that laterally in life. At the time, that was, like, old people playing guitars. I didn't really like... It was a bit loud for me. Yeah. So I was a bit, like, I don't know. that Like, I could hear it, but, like, it wasn't quite what I wanted to listen to. And my sister, she would be, like, more nearer in age to me. She was into like a lot of that indie music of the 80s stuff, like starting yeah. with gas stuff, Madness and the special. Yeah. They were really big. So I used to like them and I could like those videos were really interesting for its time was way ahead of what was previously coming out. But it was around then that I really started getting into like, I was in secondary school in the 80s. So I would have been into like Simple Minds and bands like that because they were kind of big bands at the time. Yeah. But I would have probably preferred, as I got laterally older, you know, the Smiths or Echo. The Smiths the are Blind. brilliant, yeah. A lot of those 80s indie music, that was really big in the scene then. But then like, you know, it was at that age, you're getting older. Like I went to Simple Minds in Crow Park in 1986. No way. So that was like, and that was one of the, like you two, of course, as well, would have been quite influential because I'm from North Dublin. They were kind of starting out around that time. So everybody, like, obviously, you know, people have a little bit of a jadedness related to you too, because they have so much longevity. But it was very exciting at the time that they were like, 
on English TV and selling records and like Pride was being released. And, you know, when you think of that's such an iconic song and it, like people hear it so many things, like it's kind of weird. I was trying to think about, you know, I remember it when it came out originally yeah. and having that kind of a, it was obviously a good song, but I sense of pride, you know, there was an Irish band on top of the pops and it was big at the time. So that would have been, they would have been influential. I always would have liked them and tuned in and out to them in relation to them, particularly when they're from North Dublin, where I'm from. So that was kind of good. Uh, then in the 90s, I would have been into like, um, I would have really liked bands like the Stone Roses. I would have liked, yeah. I would have liked James. I would have liked the Happy Mondays. Kind of an extension of that 80s. It was kind of the start of Britpop type of thing. You kind but, of built up your musical interests. Then. Yeah, like, you know, I think it's yeah. very much in like, I think the difference as well is that like, Unlike now today where you can have access to so many things so easily, is that like, you know, you would be like going to college and these would be bands that college people were listening to. You know what I mean? When you're in secondary school, people were like, oh, everybody's listening to this band in secondary school. And even in college, you know, you'd have certain bands who would be like the Cranberries, for example. I remember they played like a university disco in the 90s. No way. That I was at, you know, and it was so like, you know, they that's how they would have built their following and stuff. And it's quite like, you know, it's very good. It's very interesting. But if you know, it's much more interactive than, say, downloading it now or just clicking yeah. on it and listening to it. So from then, I would have been would have liked that in the 90s. Then around... Going into two thousands and stuff like that, I would have liked you know early Coldplay and stuff like that, Travis yeah. and things. You know, again, I always liked these kind of like bands before they became too famous. You know, yeah. You know? So All like bands that became, aren't famous like, are brilliant. Sorry, I think that a lot of bands that aren't famous are very good. Yeah, but I think the problem is they get too good and then they get too famous and exactly. then they start like becoming too anthony. So and like and it is I'm not like snobbish about it. I don't like I have certain yeah. friends who are like I don't like that band because too many people like them. I, <laughs> no, <laughs> you're not like that. I see weird, exactly like. where you mean. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not like that, but I have lots of my friends are like that. I like them before anyone else liked them, and then when other people aren't liking them, I didn't like them. Now I would more <laughs> think that's connected to their music became more mainstream and yeah. more generic that other people wanted the thing. And that sold that that to them made the reason they liked them in the first place different. And look, everybody does trends. That. Yeah. Like it's very difficult to make a living, sustained living, unless you're actually selling the records. So I assume <laughs> yeah. that you you know you can be great and selective about who you want to buy it. But I think at the end of the day, you'll probably take everyone if you can. So that would have happened things. So now I'm currently like like I'm moving towards more recent. My two favorite bands at the moment are The National and Arcade Fire. So the oh. National, the National, I really, really like. They have like they're kind of an indie band from America. They'd be kind of middle stream, but they've been around for 10 years. They've had five or six albums. They're really good. The lead singer has a baritone. They have a kind of a like haunting melody type. Uh, voice they've headlined a few things they're playing in Dublin in the Three Arena I think this year haven't seen them in a couple of years so I'd like to see them and Arcade Fire I'm sure you've heard of Arcade Fire they're yeah. big obviously again like that they're a good example of what I was talking about earlier I used to like them before they were popular because they were a big <laughs> indie band but I actually think they're a band that like has kind of evolved as they've got bigger yeah, has got better. Rather than going down from being good, they're going up. That yeah. because well, of the you... following, it's encouraging them to get better. Yeah, and if you look yeah. like there's so many members in the band, and they're all seasoned musicians and professionals, and they use like they're very good live, so they use that kind of like atmosphere. But I do think that some of the music they're producing is very interesting. So I do, yes. Yeah, so I like them at the moment. Like it's you know I'm not like. I suppose, like, if you, from what I've said there, like, I'd be more, you know, like, kind of, you know, indie rock type of thing. But, like, I'm not averse yeah. to, like, I suppose the advantage to these days is, like, you know, because you have access to everything. Like, I would listen to Stormzy and I would listen to, you know, exactly designed for people of my era, but I can appreciate and understand and like it. And I probably would try and keep up with trends as much as possible without you know, listening to it all the time. So I'm probably... Obsessing, yeah. 
And I'm probably looking at like what, you know, like I suppose they have the advantage of these things like Apple Music, like it's Apple Music recommends and then there's 50 categories and you can just click on and then just listen to what people are listening to. So that or like most downloaded this week, I'll just, you know, if I like yeah. I walk all the time everywhere, so I have headphones. So I sometimes just bash on something that I don't even know what it is. And if I like it, then I'll check it out and maybe listen to more of it. And if I don't, I'll just fast forward onto something else. I think it's a sign of society, is it not? That we can yeah. just go through things really quickly. <laughs> that's so I really handy. Appreciate it fully. But I do like music. I suppose that's more what I was trying to there's, say. There's one thing now that I definitely agree with Spotify, that it's very handy and Apple Music is very handy. Me and myself, though, I always prefer kind of um, have it on hard copy. I really love the whole idea because I've got, I've got some cassettes there. A lot of that my dad had when he was a kid and that was his collection over like years and years and years and he didn't use it anymore and when i was like six i just came, came upstairs and i found this in a box and that's why i like music on hard copy because i always just think it's always nice to be able to know that's your copy yeah. of the album you have bought that album and you are going to play it on your stereo it's nice to have that kind of feeling. It's weird, like I, like when you think about it, saying to yourself, "I bought, spent ten euro buying an album that I could listen to on a streaming service for free," yet it's still, you, I still get way more enjoyment out of it. But yeah, I but do but see what you mean about music on Apple and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I I totally agree with what you're saying. I think that that shows you care more about it, you know, and that it's passionate in relation to that. And that's important. I just kind of find that now, you know, as you get older, the more convenience <laughs> helps. <laughs> so therefore, I just got a bit lazy. Whereas I would have had a great. It's okay. Like, like, CD collection, drug tapes as well. Oh my god, yeah. yeah, tapes, wow. But I do, I suppose, yeah, like I, I like, I think it was very interesting because we used to like put tape recorders up to the TV and stuff like that to record things. Yeah. And like, when you think of how crazy that actually sounds and like how low hook quality a, that must hook have been. a small piece of plastic called a VHS tape to a television to record something yeah. it, it does sound mad but it's something that a lot of people can connect to and a lot of people have yeah and about. like again i think it ties into what you just said there it, like if you did that means you care enough to, to record it it, exactly. it becomes yours there and then you keep it and it, it's important to you so i think that that's that's good thing and i think that those things are I'm a big believer in, you know, yeah. keeping things that are of value to you that have nostalgia associated with them because they mean more to you. And they might be possessions or they might be memories or it might be things you've written down. Like but photos totally, nearly. Yeah, photos. Yeah. And I, I totally encourage people to do that because it makes it more personalized and it gives you a nicer sense of memory of that occasion. And I think that it's important because I think in this, particularly in a very consumer age that we live in, we do so many things that we don't value them as much. Yeah, and I see what you mean that you care about certain things when you tape them. And I actually have, a t I have the case of a tape somewhere where I recorded literally a play off the radio. Okay. Called Wine from Greenland that... I loved listening to it the first time, um, and it was like, like, that's a mad play. But um, I actually ended up the second time getting out of tape as fast as I could, sp like spilling all those tapes, all those organised tapes, all over the ground trying to find a blank set tape to start recording. Um, but I can definitely see what you mean, and I've actually got as my final question a bit of an odd kind of question. Um, when you um, kind of look at it um, with the other questions. But this particular question is actually about another um, love of mine, is reading. And um, you have a couple of courses on reading, uh, creative writing and the wizarding world and Harry Potter, book versus film, things like that in CTYI. But I wanted to ask, what kind of books did you read growing up as my final question? So could you just explain what kind of books you read growing up? 
Yeah, of course. Um, I, I It's funny. I would definitely think I'm a much better reader now than I used to be when I was younger. And most people are the opposite in relation to that. Most people are, I don't have time to read anymore or I don't read as much. I find that like I've definitely read a lot more as I've got older. Um, so I used to like, um, when I was younger, I would have read like, you know, as I was kind of very young, you know, your basic and famous five, three and ah, best famous two. five. All those Lovely. ones. Like you see, we, we didn't have as much variety in those days. So that was kind of good. Okay. And there was very little like young adult fiction then, you know. So that was kind of your 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 staple diet related to that. Yeah. But then it was only like laterally as I got older. I still like actually that had a huge influence on me because now I read like so much crime novels now, you know, like yeah. I read a lot of like Catherine Ryan Howard and I read a lot of like Joe Spain and stuff like that my I dad read reads like them. Michael Connolly and stuff have you yeah I love yeah. Michael Connolly yeah that um, series is very good I really like that I like Ian Rankin I like a like good crime novel and then now somebody got me a present like now I'd be kind of hard to please because I have a lot of stuff <laughs> and I like you know I have lots of my own and things so somebody got me a present about two years ago of a subscription to Audible, which was like a book a month. And I walked yeah. to work and I thought that was absolutely brilliant because I love now listening to an audio book on the way to work because it would probably be one that I wouldn't normally buy. And I kind of like go and listen to it. So I listened to like David Mitchell reading his columns from a newspaper and he's really funny. Or I listened, I'm currently listening to a book called Active Oblivion set in the 17th century about the hunt for these people who killed the king in that year. It's kind of historical fiction. I kind of like that. So again, that'd be a book I'd never normally buy. But yeah. now it's like Audible and I'm listening to it and I'm walking, I kind of got into it and gripped by it. But any kind of crime novel I really like at the moment, particularly modern, I read one there recently um, which was like all the book was transcripts of emails. And I thought that was like so cool as a different genre. Than, it's like, mad, but it's brilliant. Yeah. I've read a couple of books where like part of it is like in the middle of the book uh, in Wonder by R.J. Palacio, I think. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's an email transcript on Facebook and text messages between Augie and Jack and... Uh, uh, some parents and Mr. Tushman and things like that all in the one part and I really actually enjoyed that particular chapter because it can be very interesting I yeah yeah I think I like the kind of mixing of genres and stuff like that and then it's a good sign that like you know you have to keep concentrating to keep the different medium together and to kind of understand and relate and read them so I, I love that type of stuff I love I like actually you know my favorite at the moment I love um who I know somebody who I bet you brought all his kids books is I love Anthony Horowitz oh I started reading Stormbreaker by him um, and I loved it I I actually his books are so popular they're always out of stock of Eason when I try to buy his books so I couldn't I've only read Stormbreaker so far, but he's, he's like amazing. Well, you know, he's gone into writing out of books now. Yeah. So he, like, had, he wrote uh, like two. He wrote, yes, yeah. that was one of my favorite books. That was a book within a book. So that was really good. That's what reminded me of it. And then he also wrote, he rewrote two Sherlock Holmes books. Um, he was given the thing from the Arthur Conan Doyle estate. And he also rewrote two or three James Bond books. Um, oh, yeah. And he currently has an investigative series out by, by a detective called Hawthorne, which he includes himself in the novel, which I think is really clever. So he writes about himself in as a character in a novel. It's really interesting. So I do love him. I'd say I have read some of his kids' books when I was younger, but uh, I think he's so talented and I love all that. I love, like, I think it's so important. It's like music. Reading is so important in the yeah. context of giving you something different and taking your mind off stuff from work and then just realizing how brilliant these authors are because it's just something that I just like I would think to myself I'm good at a lot of stuff I like writing I like reading I like some wow I just don't think I could ever write a novel as yeah that, from start to finish that would be so engaging it's, and it's interesting. actually really hard to write a yeah. novel 
I've started writing a book at the moment. I'm working on it at the moment called Finn, and I'm 70 pages into it. It's it's quite hard to write a novel. Um, and the thing is, I did no planning for it. I just went straight into it. Yeah. But it's but the thing is, I don't think it's supposed to do that. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> very it's very goofy though. Whenever I'm doing it, because it's it's never right. So I think, oh God, that's the best part of what I've wrote today. And I go back on it a month later and I go, what the heck? What in the name of God? Okay. Looking back on it. Um, so it's always very, very funny um, for me. But yeah, it, it's it, it definitely would be very hard to write a whole book from start to finish. Like there's a book here actually um, called uh, Until the End by a guy called Derek Landy. And this thing's like 650 pages. pages yeah. This thing is like it's mad. Like this book. He's a very talented Derek, though. I have De- to Derek Landy's very ni- good and like a very nice man. But when it comes to being an author, it's like how what mind was he in to create this character? It's it's very I think it would be very hard for him to write books, but he writes like a book a year. Yeah. So it's great. Or two books a year, even. Two books a year. Sometimes, two books yeah. coming out. Uh, one on the March thirtieth, and so I'm rubbing my hands together, just going, ah, lovely. And it's going to be my friends love school of the peasant. So we're all saying to each other, we're gonna go in school, and we're be like, did you fi- did you read this school of the peasant yet? Did you read it? So it's always very funny, but I think reading is very important, and it's. It's definitely something that should be included as an aspect of your life. If you're trying, if you finish work, if you're an adult and you have some spare time, I always read before bed. And um, if I'm reading something like this, sometimes it's not that heavy. But if we're reading something like what I'm reading at the moment, the one series by Morris Gleitzman, all about world wars and stuff, that can be a bit heavy going heavy. to bed but so i don't really read that too much before bed but reading is definitely something that you need to keep in your life and it can be very helpful as well you definitely know that yourself yeah and i think that i think the thing that people sometimes make a mistake with is that they think oh i didn't read all my life so i can never start there's pl- like as long like if you yeah. can actually read like you can take it up at any age of your life and i think it's very comforting and then you know, books change, but like there's so many books written that like there's genres for everyone. I think that that's the great thing. You know, you, you, you'll you never not find a book written about something you're interested in. And I think that that's fantastic. And nowadays, like music, it's so easy to access and find these books now. Whereas previously, we were really like getting them in mobile libraries and things like that. Yeah. You know, it had a lot of, uh, it was a lot more tricky to do all that stuff. Whereas now, there's much more exposure and there's much more ways of getting them. And I think that that's a great thing. And there's more reviews and there's more kind of people putting up content that's interesting and accessible to people. And I, I hugely encourage, I think that's one of the great things, you know, there's a lot of people problem with like the internet, but that's one of the very good things about it. Yeah. It's the accessibility that's, of these things. Like to ask, um, like I wouldn't read and like ebooks and i would listen to books well most of the time but yet i would still encourage using audiobooks and stuff i think of them as a great invention yeah and when you think about it for some people they don't like it a lot of people do and like i i like audiobooks as um and ebooks because they can be very helpful um but yeah they, they they can be used a lot throughout somebody's life Absolutely. And I think it's great when you have somebody really exciting reading them who you know or like, and then they're reading them, they're really interested in what they're saying. You feel like they're in the room with you. I think that that's yeah. really good too. Yeah. And so I like, yeah, I do like a good audio book. Um, and again, I always feel it's a good thing to balance it between if you're reading, a, exactly you kind of touched on it there. If you're reading one book, you should be probably listening to an audiobook of a totally different genre so that your mind is kind of different. Yeah, different so points. because like um if I was to like I always find it very hard to listen to um 
something while thinking about a book or something. So that's why I would usually, uh, sometimes I would stop a book and put it away and maybe read another book for a little while. But I would never read two books at the same time. Okay. That could, that I find that very odd. But yeah, I'd never read two books at the same time. Yeah, I don't um, know how people, I know people who do three or four at the same time. I just ugh. don't know how they do it. Oh, God. My sister is unreally good at them. <laughs> wow. Um, but then she'd read about seven or eight books a week. So, uh, fair yeah, enough, I see. Like, I, yeah, I, so probably I, if you're just reading I, the same I, one, it wouldn't yeah, be as exciting. I, I'd be putting in this a uh, lot of hours like into reading. Not, And I'd always tell people it's not because I'm forced to, it's because I love reading. Yeah. I love the stories. Like, the most Lightsman books that I'm reading, I'd be reading them daily, like a book a day, that they're so good. I'd be reading for nearly half the day on it because it's so gripping and I always enjoy them. But yeah, that's why I love reading. Yeah, reading should be a pleasurable activity. It shouldn't be a punishment. Exactly. Um, well, that about wraps up all of my questions and you have answered them all beautifully, Kong. So I'd just like to say thank you for joining me on Logan Sounds Off. It's been such a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me on. I think it's fantastic to have younger people doing stuff like this. I thought the questions you asked were hugely interesting, brought me back to my younger self. So that was good. Um, You're still in your younger self column, don't you? Yeah, in my mind, in my mind, in my mind, but maybe not my body. Okay. So (laughs) in relation to that, I totally encourage you to continue to do it. Um, I think it's a really great activity for you and i like i not not in a way of like oh it should be a kid like you do it so well and professionally so you definitely should continue doing it at the level that you're doing it at and evolving and learning from doing it i think that's it and also keep up with the music and with the reading i think that both of those things are so helpful and you know there's just like without being you know this is definitely that i'm getting older but like there's not as much people doing that anymore so i think that it's great that as a role model for young people who are interested in that type of stuff it's great to be passionate about it to talk about it because then somebody could be just listening to you going yeah you know something i'm gonna go and read a book now because it's okay and i think that that's as opposed to other people giving you a totally different message all the time and never hearing anything so well done you on what you're doing and i look forward to your Continued world domination, is that the goal? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is the goal. Hold world domination. Yeah, look, look, that's good. And then I can say I knew you before you were famous, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so listen, that's... well done. That sounds fab. Um, look forward to hearing the final product. And let me know if there's anything else I can do for you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Colm. It's been so fun to talk to you. Yeah, it was Bye, really Colm. great. Thanks a lot. And uh, follow up with anything, just let me know. Oh, yeah, I will, definitely. Take Um, care. Say hi to your mum and dad. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Logan Sounds Off. You can follow me on X, Facebook and Instagram at Logan Sounds Off. And don't forget to subscribe and not miss any more cool episodes. Bye, guys.